Mac, here's a front-end job for you. Al says for us to look the job over. What's up, Joe? Flat spots on the front tires. Look here. Both front tires are beginning to cup. Want to set it up to check the front end? I don't think we'll have to do that. We'll just pull these wheels off and switch them around from front to back. Hey, quit pushing. They're trying to run a guy down. I came over here to help you fellows out. Okay, Tech. You better start working on Mac. He wants to switch tires on this job without even checking the front end. Well, what's the matter with that? Mac don't need gauges for a simple job like this. He can read those tires like a book. Yeah? Then let's hear him read this chapter. It's easy, Joe. Flat spots may become troublesome after about 3,000 miles of driving. And they appear only on front wheels that don't drive the car. If this is the only kind of wear showing on the tread, front end alignment is the last thing we have to worry about. You better tell him about those tests, Mac. You know, the ones the research engineers made on that special car. Sure, I remember. The car was built so that the drive was through the front wheels. The rear wheels were mounted on a rigid axle. Another thing, the brakes were taken off the rear wheels. Right, Tech. This test car had free-running rear wheels that didn't have to do any steering, braking, or driving. Just before the test, the rear wheels were checked to make sure they were lined up perfectly straight. Then the car was run back and forth on a 25-mile stretch of good highway. And don't forget that the rear wheels were jacked up every time the car was turned around. That's right. All those rear wheels had to do was run straight ahead. Well, Joe, can you guess what happened to those rear tires after they'd been run a while? Now, wait a minute. Don't tell me they showed flat spots. Give the man 64 silver dollars. Yep, you're right, Joe. Those tires flat spotted just as badly as some you've seen on front wheels. In other words, the test proved that tires on free-running wheels can flat spot even though the wheels are perfectly aligned. So... How are you going to pin flat spots on misalignment of the front suspension? Yeah, I guess you're right. But hey, what about balancing the wheels? Maybe that'd stop flat spotting. Not so fast, bright boy. Mac didn't tell you, but the wheels and tires on the test car were perfectly balanced. That's right, Joe. Those wheels were balanced, but the tires still developed flat spots. So there's two things you can skip as far as flat spotting is concerned. You just won't get anywhere by changing front-end settings or balancing the wheels. Well, how are you going to stop flat spotting? You can switch the tires, Joe. Of course, maybe that's too simple for a smart guy like you. Don't be too rough on him, Tech. There are lots of folks who've got wrong ideas about tire wear. You see, Joe, flat spots don't usually cause much trouble until the tires have been on the front for about 3,000 miles of driving. So... If you switch the tires before 3,000 miles, you get the front tires on the rear before the flat spots become serious. That's a good idea. You see, tires on the rear wheels of a rear drive car don't get flat spots. That's probably because the driving action of rear wheels makes the tires wear evenly. In fact, even if a tire does show a small amount of flat spotting, you can usually clean it up by running it on the rear. Of course, if you're smart, You'll switch the front tires around before the flat spots show up. Yeah, and that's just one good reason for hammering up the customers to switch those tires every 2,500 miles. Now, there's another reason for switching tires. You see, each tire wears a little differently, depending on its running position on the car. When you switch tires to give each tire a chance to run in every position, you equalize the wear. That means you get longer life from the whole set of tires. Okay, now let's get started on this job. To begin with, we'll put the spare tire on the rear. Hey, how does the spare get in this? Look, Joe, you'll go farther on five tires than you will on four, won't you? Tech means that running the spare in with the other tires gives you 25% more mileage from a set of tires. All right. First, we move the spare to the right rear. Then we put the right rear wheel on the left front. 
After that, we'll move the left rear wheel up to the right front. For the next move, we switch the left front wheel to the left rear, and the right front wheel then becomes the spare. Now, the next time those tires are switched, the spare will go on the right rear, and the flat spots will be smoothed up. You see, Joe, even though nobody knows what causes flat spotting, we do know that tire rotation will correct it. Okay, I've got the pitch on flat spotting. And uh, why are you giving out free information? How about second rib wear? Well, Joe, second rib wear is just another name for underinflation wear. You'll see how it gets its name if you think about the way tires contact the road. First, let me remind you of a few things about the conventional tire that was standard on passenger cars up until recently. That conventional tire was designed to ride on the center rib. That's right. And when the old conventional tires wear down, the center ribs get the most wear. The second ribs ordinarily show less wear. Yeah, but the super cushion job is a different animal. Sure, look at the way this new tire is built. On the super cushion tire, the tread is flatter. So the tire contacts the road surface for its full width. This means that the second ribs are doing their full share of the work of supporting the car, and it's natural for them to show their share of the wear. Sure, and to help them carry the load, these second ribs are backed up by extra rubber. Now, on the other hand, when you drive on a tire that's underinflated, the center ribs show the least wear. Most of the weight of the car is supported by the outer or edge ribs. Those edge ribs are pressed tight against the road, so they show only moderate wear. The second ribs are held loosely and scrub back and forth across the road surface. This means that the second ribs show the most wear. Naturally, with underinflation, you get heavy wear on the second ribs and very little wear on the center ribs or the edge ribs. Listen, Mac, let's pull one of these corpses out of your morgue and show this guy what we mean. Take a look at this tire, Joe. This is a super cushion job that was run underinflated until it was ruined. You see, the outer edges of this tire are worn down practically to the fabric. Sure, there's rubber left in the center, but it's no good to anybody now. Hey, hold it a second, Mac. Here comes the boss. Let's flip this record over and see what he's got to say. How's it going, Mac? Fine, Al. I was just explaining underinflation wear to Joe. Okay, Mac, I'm glad you did. Now I'd like you to take a look at Mr. Jameson's car. He's taking a trip tomorrow, and he wants to make sure the front end's okay. All right, Al. I'll take care of it right now. You know, fellas, you can save a lot of work and do a better job if you learn to read wear patterns the way Mac does. Probably every one of these tires here in the morgue would still be running if the owner had known exactly what was causing the wear. For example, take a look at this tire. Well, that's overinflation wear, isn't it? Yes. The pressure in this tire was so high that the tread bulged out and wore off down the center. You see, Joe, overinflation gives you a hard ride. If the tire is greatly overinflated, you'll get less mileage. Now, here's another worn-out tire. Could you tell me... Let me take a closer look. Well, the wear is pretty evenly distributed across the tread, so I'd say this tire just wore out and died a natural death. Yeah, but this tire might have been driven to an early death, Joe. You see, driving habits and driving conditions have a lot to do with tire life. Take speed, for instance. Driving at a speed of 80 miles per hour, you get less than one-half the tire mileage you get at 30 miles per hour. Yeah, and another thing that cuts tire mileage way down is fast starting and stopping. Sure, guys that take off like they were jet-propelled and then stand the car on end at the next stop are wasting a lot of rubber, as well as a lot of gas. And watch out for those turns. If you take the turns too fast, you cut down your tire mileage. Well, Joe, how an owner drives is pretty much his own business. But it's our business to do a good job with the tools we use. For instance, 
I carry a little gadget here in my pocket that's worth its weight in gold, as long as it's used right. Yeah? Let's see it. A tire gauge. Well, for the love of Mike. You sure fooled him that time, Al. <laughs> yes, but I'm serious, Tech. The tire gauge is one of the most important tools we have, so it's got to be treated carefully. Remember, if the gauge gets knocked or bumped, it may read several pounds too high or too low. Sure, and that's why Mac checks his gauge against a master gauge he knows is right. And another thing to remember about tire gauges is the difference between cold and warm pressures. When a tire is driven on the road, it heats up, and the pressure of the air in the tube increases. Don't let that pressure build up worry you, Joe. The tires are built to run at higher pressure when they're warm. When super cushion tires have been warmed up by city driving, the right pressure is 27 pounds. Of course, if the car has been standing for several hours, the tires will be cool, and they should show at least 24 pounds. Now, after a car has been driven on the highway at high speeds, the pressure will increase to 29 pounds or more, depending upon the speed. But keep this in mind. Don't make the mistake of letting air out of hot tires. Remember that, Joe. Don't ever let air out of a hot tire. You see, letting air out of a hot tire makes the tire run even hotter. And that weakens it so it wears out faster. If you reduce the pressure in a tire when it's warm, the pressure will drop below 24 pounds when the tire cools off. So you'll get underinflation wear. The main thing to remember is to check tire pressures accurately and regularly, at least once a week. Well, Joe, it looks like Max threw with the road test on Jameson's car. Come on over and look at it as soon as you're finished here. How does it look, Mac? Seems to handle okay on the road, Al. The front end's in pretty good shape, except for one thing. Look at the wear patterns on this tire. That's toe-in wear. Sure, I can feel it. The outside edges of the treads are worn off on both front tires. You better check that with a gauge and set the toe into specifications. Say, Tech, has the boss been staring in his crystal ball again? How does he know if it's toe-in or camber wear without checking it? He uses his head, fella. You could figure it out if you tried. Look at it this way, Joe. With too much toe-in, the outside edges of both tires face ahead. That means the grinding action of the road surface wears down the outer edges of the ribs. You can feel that by running your hand across the tread. Toe out is just the opposite. The inner edges of the tires point to the front, and the road wears down the ribs from the inside out. You going to check this job for camber, Mac? Look, Joe, what happens if the wheels are set with the wrong camber? Well... If you got the wrong camber, the wheels would be slanting instead of standing up straight, like they ought to. That makes the tires show more wear on one edge than the other. Yeah, you're right, Joe, but you don't see that kind of wear on these tires, do you? All the ribs are worn about the same amount, so the only thing we've got to worry about on this job is the toe-in. That's right, Tech. Now let's check the wheel bearings and scribe our lines. Hey, it looks like there's play in the wheel when you rock it. Maybe the bushings are loose in the front end. Hold on a second, Joe. I'll take a look. Sure. I can see by the way the linkage is moving that the play is not in the wheel bearings or kingpin bushings. You're just feeling the normal play in the control arm bushings. You gotta have some play in these bushings to prevent binding. And that play will disappear as soon as the weight of the car comes down on the wheels. Don't worry about the control arm bushings unless you can feel end play. You know end play can cause a lot of noise when you're driving on rough roads. Okay, Joe, we'll check the towing. You spin the wheels and I'll chalk the tires so our measuring lines will show up clearly. Now, by using a scriber, we got a fine line down the center of each tread and we'll be able to measure the tow in accurately. Next, We'll set her down on the turntables with the wheels straight ahead and bounce her up and down a couple of times to level the springs. Keep your eyes open, Joe. 
Max showing you how to check that toe-in right. You'll get an accurate toe-in reading, Joe, when you set the car up properly first, and then use a measuring bar to check the distance between the wheels at hub height. Yeah, and remember, you gotta be just as careful when you're checking camber, too. You said it, Tech. Before you check camber, first make sure the floor is level, then bounce the car up and down to level the springs. And don't forget to check that gauge. And another thing, Joe, always be sure to chalk the rims for run out and turn them so the high spots are either at the front or the back. Otherwise, you'll wind up with a bad camber reading. And that winds up the story on tire wear, fellas. It all goes to show you can avoid a lot of unnecessary alignment jobs and do your customers a real service if you learn to read those treads. <laughs>